Okay, I, uh, I'm Bill Dutton, I'd like to welcome you. This is uh, so great to see this come together because uh, we've organized this in a very democratic fashion and you know what that means. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it's been such a, a lovely experience to work with all of the organizing uh, partners over the last year uh, putting this together because uh, it's a very, it's one of the most complicated events I've, I think I've ever, <laughs> I've ever done. Uh, to explain how we joined two different organizations. Uh, it all started, I think, uh, I was thinking of doing a pre-conference uh, related to the new internet world, and, and I think Jack uh, uh, spoke to me about uh, the uh, Chinese Internet Research Conference and uh, their new conference, and we put our heads together and said, oh, there's got to be a way that we can build on these two events and make them come together in a nice way. And, and so. Uh, uh, what you've seen is, is a result of uh, a lot of collaboration with a lot of great partners. And I don't think I've ever had that many logos on it. And, and, if, and if we've left one off, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there's so many partners. And, uh, but that's uh, but truly worked in a very collaborative uh, partnership. Because I want to just say a couple of words of thanks uh, uh, to kick off. Then we will uh, move very quickly, instead of, uh, uh, of each, each of our organizing uh, partners uh, uh, welcoming you, we're going to have to put them on the spot right away. And basically, we're asking uh, 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 Dorothy Zenberg, my colleague from the Harvard Kennedy School, the Belfast Center, will uh, chair the panel on asking people to say, you know, what the key questions of the conference is, is China the change in China reshaping the internet, or is, uh, actually is the internet, or you could also pick up the question of is the internet uh, in, impacting China in particular ways. So we'll get the debate started as soon as possible. But first of all, let me thank uh, all of the organizing committee. I have enjoyed working with everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for your patience in working with us. Um, those who sent abstracts, we greatly appreciate that, and uh, many people read abstracts, and uh, you'll go un unsung, but I think uh, I re really appreciated that, and um, the review was really uh, exciting, and we saw a lot of great work. It ended up being a larger conference than we thought because we just saw too many good ideas and wanted to uh, have them presented. Uh, and everyone attending today, we really greatly appreciate it. If you manage to figure out what that we actually have an ICA pre-conference followed by a uh, Chinese Internet Research <laughs> Conference and the dinners and they're three separate events and they're all joined, <laughs> congratulations! Uh, we thought no one would understand it and somehow it seemed to come together. Uh, I mentioned the origin of this and I want to thank Jack for uh, actually uh, uh, spurring this to become a much larger and interesting event than it would have otherwise been. I'm uh, also grateful for Jillian Bolsover, who's, who's actually one of my research assistants, who's actually uh, worked with the or sort of supported the organizing committee in putting together the program and other things. And uh, I don't know, you've met outside, but uh, at some point I'm going to drag uh, Tim Davies, uh, put, who put, Davis, who put together the website, which is, I think, um, a nice, a nice uh, presentation for the, for the event, and it's well organized, and I appreciate his work. And Pauline Smith, who uh, is our events organizer, if, you know, she's out at the door. And uh, anyway, she um, made this all happen. I don't think, uh, I sometimes just close my <laughs> eyes and just trusted Pauline to deal with things. And, and she has done so very well. Uh, all, of the, all of the organizing committee uh, organizations helped contribute to making this uh, an event that, uh, that we can break even with. And, and uh, so we really appreciate both financial support, uh, all supports in kind, all sorts of, of uh, co cooperative contributions to this conference. We also had uh, Routledge, Taylor and Francis Routledge, who contributed uh, some support so that the dinner tonight, for those who have signed up, uh, can, uh, will be uh, much less expensive than it would otherwise be. So, uh, so we, uh, we have the, uh, some industry support for the dinner tonight. And they also uh, have put a, a standout with some of the journals uh, 
the Information Communication Society, which is published through Taylor and Francis Routledge, and uh, Brian Loder is back there, and he's, he's the editor of that, and he'll be talking to a lot of people, trying to get a sense of whether there's some uh, issue, uh, journal issues here or uh, uh, some papers here that, uh, that would be excellent to submit to the journal, and also people with the Chinese Journal of Communication, Jack and others, uh, are on the editorial board of that. I think hopefully we will get uh, identify some papers and encourage people to uh, uh, submit papers to one or more of the journals that we are associated with. So I guess finally, um, with that, I'm, I'm before I, uh, 30 seconds before I turn it over to Dorothy, I mean the whole impetus for this conference was the sense that so much emphasis in the in internet studies um, is placed on technical change, uh, a new a new application or a new device that we're using and so forth. And we often de-emphasize and, and don't really pay sufficient attention to the social, to how important social change is to changing the internet. And, uh, and there's probably no greater social change going on on the internet than the uh, than this uh, global shift of uh, the population of internet users from uh, being dominated uh, by in numbers by uh, people in North America and West Europe uh, to uh, everywhere else in the world that is, that is now coming online when we talk about the next two billion users or the next five billion users or the next trillion devices that are going to be connected to the internet. These are uh, huge social changes in terms of the population of the internet world. And so uh, what will difference will this make uh, to the future of the internet? Will it remain as vital? Will it remain as free? Will it remain as private? And, uh, and it's uh, up to, uh, so we want to focus on how this changing new internet world uh, might reshape the vitality and social implications of the internet, and not just look at technical change, although many papers will look at, at, at the interaction of these developments. So with that, I want to turn it over to Professor Dorothy Zenberg. Uh, she has been a, a wonderful friend of the OII, as she's helped support so many of our conferences and is so insightful in uh, so many areas. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to chair of what's a, a very open-ended session with our session. I don't and however you wish to organize it, Dorothy. Oh, organize, now that's interesting. <laughs> for, for some reason, I've been sitting here singing the, the magical mystery tour of the Beatles, and, and I thought if we gave ourselves up to that, that the conference would generate its own shape. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I think I, my role is that of watchdog. I think I counted eight people. We have a little bit less than 60 minutes, so I'm going to say that everybody gets five minutes, and my job is to say enough. And uh, we will go from one person to another on what uh, he or she is doing. Uh, if I could take just two seconds, because uh, a lot of my work has been in social psychology, and I thought I would just tell you some of the things that have been going through my mind in the past week of what I feel affect the way we're going to be talking about the internet and China. I began, I think it was last, kind of last side of the days, but let's say a fortnight ago as the Brits say, uh, at a meeting at Harvard with what I call the golden oldies in China hand work, as Vogel, Merle Goldman, uh, everybody there but me I think spoke Mandarin. And the discussion, which was officially about Henry Kissinger's latest book, turned out to be a discussion about cyber crime and cyber warfare, about which no one at the table knew anything. And that was absolutely fascinating to see a previous generation still doing a lot of work, but at sea about what is really going on. I said we were like a bunch of people swimming underwater. We didn't know what we were really talking about. But that was what was on their minds. Last week, ending actually just yesterday, Harvard had a group of people in Shanghai uh, talking about politics, essentially, and the internet. And one of the things that came out of it was a statement by William Kirby, who chairs the government department at Harvard, saying that in the history 
of both countries, China and the United States, never has there been a period when the foreign policy of the other was of primary importance. And so that at this point, both China and the United States share a sense that the other country is the center of their foreign policy concerns. Then I thought, again, the last point was I get on the airplane to come here and I'm thinking the impact of China on the internet, the internet's impact on China, and I get off the plane and I'm thinking prism metadata. What are those? And so I feel we've got a hundred balls in the air. We're going to try to get hold of some of them and bring it down to the initial organizing principle of the conference, which is, I say, the magical mystery tour. So let us begin. And since I know very few of you here, if you would be kind enough, why don't we begin with you, Professor Price? And you just tell your name and say what you do and what the organizing principle is of what you're going to say. Uh, I'm Monroe Price. I'm uh, a, prof a professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and active here at the Program for Comparative Media Law and Policy. I've been very fortunate in working with many of you in, on, C on the Internet Re Research Conference and on, on many other things. Uh, in thinking about this, um, I guess I've been interested in, in two things. One is several things, but I'll take two. One is what I call a, a kind of period of anxieties. Uh, anxiety over the internet and inst instability. That is, say, anxiety on the part of governments throughout the world that there's something that needs to be controlled because of things that are so close to issues of stability and, um, and uh, continued power. And on the other hand, the anxiety that there's an opportunity to have uh, liberatory media that will be lost. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strange moment, I think, in which there's an intense um, feeling of, of, of unfulfilled uh, capacity. That, that is to say, there, there's major things swirling in the world, and, and everyone is trying to figure out how to, how to deal with it. So the, the question is, what happens in a period of heightened anxieties? And what, what is the relationship between anxiety and policy? So uh, uh, we, we know maybe Dorothy, as a social psychologist, can talk about this. But it, it's interesting to see what's the relationship between rational policy making and anxiety-driven policy making. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look at the world as being one in which the US and China now are competing to fashion internet policy globally with Europe and, and, and other people as well. So I, I think I'll leave it. Yes. Is that OK? Yeah, my name is Wu Mei. I'm from Department of Communication, University of Macau. And uh, I'm very pleased like, uh, to be in, in this conference because they all started with the last year's conference I organized at University of Macau is called Social Media, Digital Network and Globalization. It's a, it's a China, it's an annual conference, like it's a China New Media Association conference. Every year they organize conference inside of China, but uh, last year I was able to bring them outside of like uh, China mainland. And uh, we try to make it as a global, the international conference. So it's a very, we're very honored to invite the Bill to our conference and to be one of the keynote speakers. So that is how, and uh, he invited our <laughs> university to participate in this uh, conference. I think it's, uh, I'm very pleased to see like how this uh, internet and new media in China become come to the agenda to the like university, the prestigious university like Oxford. Uh, and uh, I, myself, my experience is I, I study communication, particularly from this uh, communication technology perspective of the Marshall McLuhan. It's because I was trained in Canada. I got my MA and PhD from Canada. So my professor, my doctor professor, he is, is in the Innes and the Marshall McLuhan this is a school of thought. So I was always in, 
it's interested in how this new media is influenced on Chinese society. It's even from very beginning when the internet was uh, introduced into Chinese, like even before into China, by just overseas the Chinese community in early 90s. So I have been working on this uh, internet in China and uh, mobile communication. Well, it's mostly from Marshall McLuhan's perspective. So I've tried to, I, I tried to have this idea that uh, these new media really have great impact on the Chinese society and in making this transformation from China, China, from older China into the new China, but still the future is not, not clear what this new media technology bring into China. So I'm very happy to see everyone's here. I hope there are a lot of um, insightful discussions coming up. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Randy Kluver from Texas A&M University, and uh, I just want to thank, again, Bill for taking on this project. You might not have known exactly what you were getting into, <laughs> um, but we, uh, speaking on behalf of the executive committee, we've, we've long hoped that OII would, would host this conference, and, and we're very happy that it happened this year. Um, and uh, we've made it through the confusion. Everybody's here. <laughs> I saw several people out on the street looking, <laughs> trying to find this place today. That iconic blue door is always a lot easier to find. So anyway, um, I am uh, very pleased to be here this year. I've been um, f tracking with Chinese internet research for, for a long time, um, not doing so much research myself on, on the internet in China as much as doing a lot of research on how we're th talking about the internet in China and how that's affecting our academic and political discourse, how it affects our politics and so on and so forth. Now um, I, I want to also highlight, and I'm, I'm sure that Bill will do this at some point, but this shift that Bill has been talking about for some time, which is the new internet world as as internet users in China have now become the largest group of internet users in the world, much larger than, than in the United States and other countries, um, how does that affect the, the internet going forward? Um, and I want to push that just a little bit further. It's, it's not just the number of users who affect what the internet becomes, but those who are the designers and the architects. Um, just as an architect or a city planner figures out where you will walk and then designs a sidewalk to make you go that way. Mm -hmm. So the architects of the internet, the designers of the internet, in, in a sense, design certain kinds of values into it. I think we're well beyond the technology is neutral kind of debate that we decided a long time ago is probably uh, not well thought out, but clearly the technology embodies certain kinds of values, if not political values, certainly technological and technocratic values. As Chinese companies, um, as Chinese policymakers and uh, as Chinese institutions really do assume a much larger role in what the design of the internet and what the design of the technical interfaces will be and so on and so forth. We, we have, uh, again, a further opportunity to think about where the internet is going and what it's going to become. So it's not just the users that drive what the internet becomes, it's, it's all the infrastructure behind it and those who design it. I myself am very interested in the geopolitics of, of the internet. We um, are very accustomed to thinking about the politics of the internet, particularly how the, the internet affects um, domestic political situations. So this week we're talking about Turkey, and, and Bill, I noticed the OII has a section on your webpage about what's happening with Turkey. We talked about the internet in Syria for years and, and decades, really, we've been talking about the internet in China. We haven't spent as much time thinking about the geopolitics of the internet. How does the internet and the associated technologies with it affect the geopolitical reality, mm -hmm. something that you hinted at a little bit earlier, where our thinking about China now is not just what is the political thought of Mao, but rather what are, what, what are the ways in which the technical networks interact with foreign policy and with uh, the relations between states. Last year was the uh, 40th anniversary of Nixon's famous visit to China in 1972. And of course, we've, we've heard about Barack Obama's famous pivot to Asia. I'll try to keep going in spite of it, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh my God. Maybe you want to wait one second. I think okay. this is the last. <laughs> we maybe need to bring in the additional chairs at this point. Wendy, it's all because of you are so attractive. <laughs> I guess. It all got very interesting all of a sudden. Let me, um, let me highlight one other thing that, that I think has been fascinating, which is when, when Hillary Clinton became um, Secretary of State for the United States, she immediately proclaimed Internet freedom as a, as a key plank of foreign policy. And Internet freedom and the associated values with that had long been an element of foreign policy. Madeleine Albright, Bill Clinton talked about this, but, but Hillary elevated this to a new level and talked about certain technological values as inherent with American national interests. And we haven't yet explored really what that means and how that's going to continue to work out. But all of these things hint at the new reality that is emerging. It's not just that internet will affect the politics of China or the politics of the United States, but the internet is going to begin affecting the geopolitics of all these states, of the relationships between states like China, Germany, United States, Britain, and so on and so forth. And beginning to move beyond the single country study in terms of thinking about that new internet world, I think is an important shift for us to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. I happened to have been in Hanoi just at the time that Hillary Clinton issued that paper. Mm -hmm. And everybody working in the American embassy was so excited about it. They had this document. Everybody had a printed copy because it was saying the internet is and the freedom that goes with it is central to our foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank, thank you. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Bing Hua Ang, or in the Chinese way, Ang Bing Hua. <laughs> um, I am running a, a research center called the Singapore Internet Research, research Center. Uh, it's actually modeled after uh, Bill Dutton. We spoke to him for two years to come up with a name. Okay, first of all, if you look at Oxford Internet Institute, why Oxford? Why not England, you know, or global, or intergalactic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, why Oxford, right? Okay, Oxford. So we chose Singapore. Uh, why Internet? Why not new media? Why not digital media? Okay, so it's internet, and, we, and he said you could encompass mobile and gaming. Okay, all right, so we chose internet too. And then he's was institute, and I was a research center. Randy, by the way, was my colleague. He was the first director of the institute, I'm, of our center, rather, and I'm the, the second director. Um, Monroe Price has been very modest. He's actually sort of the founder of this Chinese uh, re, uh, uh, conference. Uh, you don't speak any Chinese, do you? Do you speak Chinese? Okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> so that tells you where that. So Monroe is everywhere. He's an amazing guy. Okay, so uh, it's kind of good to be back. And, you know, Monroe is like, he has a vehicle in Oxford. When I, I was here on sabbatical, year 2000, 2001 at, at um, Wolfson College. And um, Monroe says, here, there are two keys. One to my office at Wolfson and one to my transport. So the office I went in, okay, and to transport, I, I look, where is this transport? A, a big black bicycle <laughs> at Wolfson College. So Monroe, thank you for the transport as well. Um, I want to say that um, this conference, I thought, had two purposes as for, for me. Um, uh, I'm glad to be involved in it. Um, one, one, of, one of the keys was to build up the research capacity in, in, uh, in, in Asia. Uh, I have a, re a research program that is funding my center, uh, and, and uh, we try to build the research capacity really in Asia. And now it's gone somewhat global uh, through, the, through the IDRC. Uh, we've seen the quality of the papers improve over time, um, and I think some of you here are sort of beneficiaries of that. You've seen the critiques, the reviews, and you know things have improved. But the other uh, the thing that's of interest to me is the question of um, not so much China internet or internet in China, but cu but culture. So I abstract uh, being an academic, I abstract and theorize uh, the question of China to to more of culture. And I think the question of culture comes in because um, uh, the issue is: Do you look at the internet as a technological? device, medium, instrument, or do you see it as, um, uh, for example, a, a media sort of, you know, instrument so that with media you have culture automatically coming in, right, because there are no two countries with the same media laws, for example, and media, you know, the, the way we treat media, the way we speak to each other, how we handle things, you know, they, they plays a part. Let me just quickly end on this. I, I drove, I've been here now for almost two weeks, drove a car from London to Edinburgh and back, Within 24 hours, I almost got two tickets, <laughs> okay? Uh, one was the bus lane in, in, in UK, <laughs> right? And the cameras are everywhere, so once you're into the bus, oh, you got you, you know, the camera taking a picture of you, or something like that, okay, so that's one. 
The other one, well, I think we managed to appeal that and that sort of went away, I think. Okay, I think, I'm not sure, I gotta ask my friend <laughs> to find out. The other one was that we came in late and then it was dark and so I parked on, and they told me to park, you know, the motel, uh, uh, B&B keeper says park somewhere, you know, um, um, <laughs> near the college. So, okay, near the college, Look, looks to be free. Okay, we had a dinner, came back and then we got a sign, you know, um, it's 70 pounds for two hours of parking. But if you pay within two weeks, you get a 50% discount, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, <laughs> so, so now you know. So again, we did an appeal. They, they, they showed us, they showed me the photo, okay, the, the car was two meters away from the sign, you know? And then the camera, the photo taken, uh, the car was there, and then the sign was there, two meters away. Um, and uh, okay, so we drove on, and one other thing about UK driving is that it's very frustrating. There are no signs telling the speed limit. So I've been paranoid, right? So I've got, just got two tickets within 24 hours, right? <laughs> and now I'm, I'm traveling the road without any traffic signs, you know, like, what is the speed limit? How would you behave, right? So we all drove very slowly and the cars are like, you know, trailing us, right? <laughs> <laughs> Flashing the lights, like, you know, you guys. Okay. And to me, okay, part of this is like, the English seem to say that you must know the law. You just have, you found the address here, right? Did you find the address here? You must know the address. <laughs> it's common law, okay? So now the question is, is this, how do you see the internet, you know, that the law is, you should know, you should know about the law. We don't need to write you a law, right? But in China, it's quite, clearly quite different. In Singapore, too, you have to write the law. Okay, so in, in the, I guess in the UK, you can turn where there is, where there is no, no U-turn sign, right? It's what you call, in Singapore, you call it nuts. No U-turn sign, nuts. You can turn where there is no nuts. If there's a nuts, no written sign, you don't turn. How do you see the internet? Is it really a cultural thing or is it really just a technological thing? And I think that's one of the things that we see is that there's a big part of culture that affects um, uh, the, the internet. And so I think I want to see uh, more of this, understand the internet better. And I think what we see here does have implications for the rest of the world. It's not just China alone. Uh, well, as Randy says, China is a big player now on the internet, the largest uh, country, most populous number of users. Uh, within itself, it can probably sustain a small, uh, a su su certainly sustain an economy, right? Alibaba is a big company now, and the others as well. So, interesting to see how what happens here in China, in, I mean, what we have learned here about China affects the rest of the world as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> good morning. Uh, 我英语就讲到这两句位置那么我来自交大上海交通大学我有两位同事一位是我们交通大学文科处蒋红处长<笑><笑> And the other, like, two, well, two, the two colleagues, this professor, Dean Zhang, is with, uh, <laughs> my surname, last name is Wu, and first name is Yue Hua. So, I will be the translator for Dean Zhang. The reason is because I studied Japanese, not English, when I was so if I speak in Japanese, nobody will understand. Most of you cannot understand. Uh, but not only in Japanese, even I speak in uh, English, nobody can understand it. Because I'm not good at English. I can study well. 其实呢，我在中国原来呢是工作的学校呢，是复旦大学。呃，其实呢，我在中国原来呢是工作的学校呢，是复旦大学。呃，在那里工作了三十年。I have worked. I have worked there for thirty years at Fudan University. 呃，
uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. I have been working there for eight years. So in total, I have worked for uh, 38 years. 我自己都很奇怪, 我怎么已经工作了38年? So sometimes I personally myself was kind of a uh, uh, puzzle or like a, a why I like, have worked so long. So long. <laughs> years. Uh, 那么可是很高兴的呢, 是我在, uh, 在我到上海交通大学工作以后呢，新媒体兴起了。But uh, one thing is, one good thing is when I feel I'm like uh, in the process of aging. Now I'm aging. Uh, uh, one new phenomenon, uh, the new media, internet, is becoming uh, prosperous. 新媒体呢，给我个人呢也带来了新的活力和新的追求。A new media also brought has brought kind of new energy. Uh, kind of new ambition, uh, kind of one thing I'm seeking uh, in my life. I'm also kind of very excited, thrilled by their uh, conference here. 因为, uh, and also because of the Chinese media, it brought so many other countries to my attention. Because the uh, new media in the internet uh, has brought has caused so much uh, discussion and deliberation in the, uh, the international uh, academic or not only academic uh, community, uh, not only in China but throughout the world. So that uh, made me feel very happy. Uh,人类发明技术,呃,技术呢反过来又改变人类,这是一种非非常奇妙的现象。So uh, uh, that uh. Human uh, have invented technology, and technology has then uh, shaped also our life, the human. Uh, so that's kind of uh, very uh, how it, uh, good, uh, amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, I think Deng Xiaoping, because he had a saying called "Technology is the first industry." That uh, uh, one sentence by our uh, former uh, country leader. Uh, uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, he said one sentence like, uh, technology is the number one, uh, first one, uh, productive force, right, in society. At the time, China was very poor, so I think Deng Xiaoping's point is more in the environmental At that time, our country, China, uh, was kind of poor. So that's why we pay so a lot of attention to technology. 就是通过科学技术让中国人民的物质生活丰富起来。Yeah, we want to use uh, technology to make our life uh, better. 但是他恐怕没想到，像互联网这种技术发展起来以后，呃，竟然在精神层面已经而且正在继续的极大的改变着中国人民的。but it, at, that, at that time, it might never occur to him that uh, the new media of the internet has not only kind of transformed our uh, economic kind of life, but also our mental life, uh, the whole uh, kind of yeah, the whole life. 而且呢，由于中国是一个呃十三亿人口的大国，因此呢，它的改变啊，就势必呃极大的影响世界。so because China is, has such a so big, it has such a big population, which is about 1.3 billion uh, population. So uh, the internet in China definitely will cause kind of has great influence on the whole world. Uh, I think this is is the reason why we are going to have such a meeting and value for the value. That is why uh, one of the causes and also uh, one of the great values why we have this conference today about China and the internet. 但尽管如此呢, 我想, 如果, 呃, 问题再重要, 但是如果缺少, 呃, 学者们的责任感和使命感, 那么这, uh, although this topic is very important, but if uh, there was no kind of reflection, discussion by academic a kind of group uh, of people. Uh, this that will be uh, less kind of uh, impossible, uh, kind of impossible, less 
因此呢我要在这里呢诚挚的衷心的感谢在座各位的努力和贡献 So uh, for this reason I really want to sincerely uh, from the deep of my heart to thank everybody here uh, to be here today for attending the conference 好最后感谢吴老师替我翻译 you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Right. I want to welcome you to, to Oxford. My name is Robert Picard. I'm a professor in the Reuters Institute, which is a visiting faculty member at Xinhua University in Beijing and uh, have been going there for the past 10 years. Um, communication systems are a reflection of economic and political power. And any belief that they are otherwise um, is just wrong. <laughs> and we have spent the past two decades trying to dissuade people from that view, partly because the view was put forth mainly by naive and immature technologists who had very little social science knowledge, quite frankly. Um, and they believed that we were creating a new world with the internet, with new rules, with new structures, with new um, types of power that were in it. And in fact, uh, what we have created is a parallel rule where the structures and norms of it are influenced by the structures and norms of the material world as well. Um, so it is not a separate world. So it is no surprise that we are dealing in a very contestable space today both in terms of domestic policies and in international policies, because all of those issues of economic and political power are being worked out in the new environment, and you can't separate them along the way. Now, obviously, this, this um, conference is really looking at China and China's position in this um, in a variety of ways, um, and China is completely important. You, ca you cannot have 20% of the world's population and increasingly um, um, users um, in the internet and expect it will not have an effect. In and so this is part of the contestment that's going on. But there are some things that we have learned already by looking at developments in the internet and at China along the way. Uh, first, it has changed a lot of the assumptions that the internet and in fact network economics um, must be fully global to be effective. Um, there needs to be critical mass, yes, um, but both of them do not require um, complete global connectivity to make it work. Secondly, the concept of the digital divide is just wrong. We don't have a digital divide. What we have is a divide, period. Partly that is based um, primarily on um, economics. We have a, half of the population of the world today that is living on, with incomes under a pound daily. We have a third of the world that has no electricity. So to talk about a digital divide is the digital problem is just compounding a problem that is already there um, along the way. Um, so we can't just talk of it in digital terms and expect that digital policies are going to alter this broader divide that exists there. Um, secondly, there, uh, thirdly, there's clearly a transformative power in the internet. Um, and China is a very prime example. Um, and one of the things that, that we see in many of the presentations today and, and, and tomorrow and have seen along the way is that effectively what the internet has done is altered one-way top-down communications in China. And it has created the opportunity for multi-directional communications, including significant bottom-up communication that's actually affecting governmental activities and behaviors. Um, and this is, a, in, in fact, one of the benefits of the Internet, is that, it, that we're all aware of and have known everywhere that this multi-directional flow helps alter power and, in communications. Um, and that is something we have, we have to be well aware of and we'll see it along the way. Um, finally, it is clear that China will increasingly influence um, the Internet globally. It certainly has a great influence domestically on, it, on the Internet, 
um, but it's having more influence now on global companies. Um, it's having more in influence as an exercise of soft power by China. And the influence will continue as, as um, Chinese um, players in the internet bring more information and communications from China to the world and vice versa. And one cannot expect that that will not affect the flow of information in the world or the division of communication power in the world in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm already getting dizzy with the thought of how does one make a choice of where to go uh, to listen to each one of these very provocative thoughts that we're being presented with. Yes, go ahead. I'm Peter Yu, professor of Drake University. Uh, so when Jack and I started this conference, the discourse about internet is very different. Um, and um, it's very gratifying to see a lot of you here who have been with us from the very beginning. And some of you I've seen for, have been here for at least five years. And so um, when we started, we don't know how long this uh, conference series will go on. But uh, by now, I think it's we, uh, we think we have reached the point of adolescence, uh, <laughs> and, uh, we are still continue uh, going. So um, when, I, when, when I was asked to do this one, I jotted for, uh, down four different points, which will help me to reflect on some of the changes that I've been going through uh, in the past decade or so. So the first one is that um, there's been a lot of discussion about the Beijing consensus or Beijing proposal, if you want to say it. Um, and that has not been something that uh, we explore in the first few years of CERF. And I think that is quite uh, important in the sense that we need to think more about what do we mean by Beijing consensus? Does, uh, is there any Beijing consensus? Or are we going toward, Beijing, uh, going toward uh, chi uh, China triumphalism? Uh, should we be more measured in terms of uh, assessment of what's going on there? Uh, because to some extent, as China becomes more powerful, there's also a bigger tendency for people to uh, look at a lot of the uh, uh, impressive development within country and uh, try to analyze the issues about internet from that perspective. But as those of you who are very uh, uh, active in doing China research, there's always a love-hate relationship with respect to anything about China. So I think the very important question we ask is how much of love do we have and how much of hate do we have in our analysis? So uh, that's quite important. The second thing that's quite important is that we spend so much time focused on the users. But uh, with respect to internet, the use is actually quite important as well. So I think, uh, to some extent, my reflection is similar to what Randy started off about architecture, about devices. So imagine a lot of the internet users, they all have one or two uh, smartphones. What is going to be environmental impact? How is it going to affect communications policy? Just by looking at the sheer numbers is going to be quite uh, important uh, at, at both the global level as well as the national level. And the third thing is that we spend a lot of time talking about political speech and politics. But it seems like from a political standpoint, the political economy with respect to what's going on is likely to be quite important. And so a lot of the discourse we have with respect to politics and political speech may not uh, necessarily get us to focus on those issues of our political economy. How the industries is going to affect the economic dynamics within a country, how the development of the cultural industry is going to affect the regional economics, and that eventually will become a major political issue. Uh, and so I think that is something that is worth exploring. And the final thing is based on the papers we have seen over the years from the graduate student paper competition. Uh, there have been a lot of papers about old issues uh, that we explore. The challenges for us is that, well, a lot of those old issues actually uh, I explore the same way as a few years ago. And it's much more difficult for us to think about whether those issues um, uh, are still uh, worth exploring in the same way, or whether we should try to find new things to say about that. And I think that's a challenge, a challenge facing a lot of graduate students. But at the same time, for a lot of the new issues, they also face a major challenge in terms of what's the methodology we want to use? <laughs> what are the new issues uh, we want to look at? And I think that is going in the sense that we need to figure out whether we want to focus on a lot of those old issues and trying to come up with new methodology to explore it so that we can have something new or whether we want to focus on the new issues that have not been explored by others, but at the same time, we cannot rely on the research from others. Thank you. 
I'm just here. I'm going to talk about the new issues. Excuse me, would you give us your name? Uh, uh, my name is uh, Jack, Jack Cho, and uh, uh, I, I, would, I would use just two uh, minutes very quickly to outline, outline the new issues I think are most important, and then give uh, my other two minutes to uh, Professor Hu Yong from Beijing University. They are also one of the organizers. I'm, I'm here representing uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, I, I want to summarize my thinking about the new issues into uh, three letters, P, C, H. Okay. We, you and I, we used to be in Los Angeles, the Pacific Coast Highway, but here it will mean something different. Okay. P means place. Okay. So there, there are different, uh, oftentimes we think about okay, the internet, okay, the world, or the China. But here I want to emphasize there are actually more than one Chinas. Okay. This is not a Okay, I, we have Taiwanese colleagues in the room. It's not about one China or two Chinas, okay? It's about conceptual <laughs> many places, okay, in different parts of, for example, okay, now people are talking about Edward Snowden, okay? And <laughs> people suddenly realize, oh, Hong Kong, okay, I'm from Hong Kong. It's a different legal system, okay? And uh, if you, uh, at the tea break, you should look for this. Uh, this is a new call for papers about sent down internet, okay? This is uh, going to be a new, Special issue about internet in rural China. Okay, it's completely different. I myself work, spend lots of time in uh, the factory zones. You can get this at the router stand outside. Okay, if you work on rural China, okay. and or the factory zone. Okay, internet uh, or mobile phone uh, system is completely different. So P stands for places. Okay, C stands for corporations. Oftentimes we only think about Beijing as the decision maker, but in many ways. The number one uh, uh, force from China that's helping the world to shape internet is Huawei. <laughs> number two is Foxconn, okay, which I work on Foxconn, this company that make all the Apple products. Okay, the Huawei is, for example, the the first 4G okay, LTE networks when they started. Okay, there are two uh, cities, both in Scandinavia, okay, uh, Stockholm and uh, Oslo. And the Oslo uh, uh, framework, uh, the, the uh, 4G, uh, this was 2009, after okay, uh, China had a very bitter relationship with Norway, okay, but Huawei still built the city-wide okay, 4G network. It's you know, one of the first two 4G networks uh, you know, uh, in the world. So uh, don't forget about the corporations. And open time, the corporations can have its own autonomy away from the government itself. And uh, so that's uh, P and C, C is cooperation, and H. H is histories. Okay, there are more than one, uh, oftentimes we tend to think, oh, there's only one history about internet in China. But actually, increasingly, I have been thinking about, you know, there are different chunks, okay, or for different sectors, different relationships. The relationship could be linear here or non-linear there. Okay, so places, corporations, and histories. Okay, there are many internets, and there are many worlds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before, uh, you can wait one second. Yeah. May I? Uh, yeah. We have more people. Yes, I was just going to call Professor Wilson, hi Ernie, to the front. And would everybody like to sit down now, please? We've had waves of people coming in. Thank you. So uh, uh, I'm not working, you know, as long as Professor uh, Zhang Guoliang, but already in my lifetime, I have witnessed uh, two very important, uh, uh, two great transformations uh, in the world. One is the emergence of the internet, and another thing is actually the rise of China. So we uh, people, you know, we are here. We are doing uh, internet research, especially. Uh, Chinese internet research. So we are at this uh, very fertile ground for research. So I'm always, uh, you know, feeling very exciting in doing uh, all kinds of uh, uh, researches in this field. Uh, but uh, uh, a question actually always uh, comes to my mind, uh, which is, you know, especially in, in recent years, which is, uh, will the internet change China, or China change the internet? 
you know, I, I think it's, this is, uh, maybe you can see it's, uh, here we are in, in, in Britain, it's a one billion pound question. Uh, so, uh, so I'm very glad to, you know, to, uh, more, uh, to see more and more researchers actually are uh, joining uh, in uh, this field and, and to maybe uh, together pursuing uh, an answer to this question. Uh, so, uh, welcome newcomers, and uh, uh, it's a great place to meet old friends. Thank you all. Thank you. Ernie, do you want to take a microphone? Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, I do have to say, as a, a personal privilege, that I've known Madam Chairman. <laughs> Before we said sheer person. For many decades, I just wanted to hear on this topic that she's been a real leader in technology Thank you. society. Uh, my name is Ernest Wilson. Uh, I'm the dean of the Annenberg School for Communication Journalism at the University of Southern California. Uh, I'm sitting next to my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to say a couple of, of, of quick things. One is um, uh, speaking institutionally um, for the Edinburgh School. It really is a pleasure to see uh, so many friends and colleagues, many of whom have been coming and organizing this event for 10 years. And I really just want to uh, congratulate the organizers uh, that have brought together many of us for a kind of long march. Uh, when, when, when no one thought that uh, this particular revolution was going to be successful and that the internet was simply just a toy or yet another uh, instrument that would not have much of an impact. And so I want to congratulate those who have been working on this issue for so long um, so that we could raise this question today of does the internet uh, affect the society or the society uh, the internet? I have to agree with my uh, colleague, Professor Picard. I think that's a kind of a foolish question. The answer is, I mean, can you imagine if we said no? <laughs> Suppose we just said, then we would, the day we would stop the day, right? And so the interesting policy questions and intellectual questions is to what extent does the internet affect society or vice versa? The other questions I think are, are naive. Uh, and I assume that they were put on the agenda to provoke grouchy people <laughs> to make that, uh, make that point. Um, I also want to uh, bring greetings from my uh, colleagues. We have seven or eight people at the Edinburgh School uh, West who are working on China now. We have the U.S. China Institute in the Edinburgh School. Uh, we have people working on public diplomacy, on macro issues of policy, micro choices that are made uh, with the internet. Um, we're publishing a number of, uh, of online magazines that I would encourage all of you uh, to look at. And certainly if you are in the neighborhood, uh, please come and see us. Uh, more recently, we have worked with uh, colleagues at Beda on something that we call the U.S.-China Binational Commission on Trust Building. And this is being, uh, we're working both with people who are very interested in the internet, um, but also Professor Wanji Se, who has written a great deal, as, as many of you know, on the issue of trust building. Um, we spent about a year and a half looking at the ways in which modern communication, modern trade, and the changing structural position of China and the United States and the world have accelerated um, trust or undercut trust between the two countries. And we've concluded from visits to Beijing and uh, Washington uh, with the uh, delegations that we organized that one way to think about uh, these new forms of communication uh, is their impact on trust, is to look at the way in which they undercut or build trust. And it is not a one way relationship, as you might imagine. And there are some uh, counterintuitive findings that 
for some demographics, greater exposure to the other country actually generates less trust than more trust. So I think those are the kind of anomalies that are, are worth paying attention to. Let me just include uh, my reference there to say that we're looking at what we call next generation public diplomacy, which is next generation people. In other words, how are the youth affected by the views um, of the two countries, We're looking especially at young people. Secondly, next generation technology. Are there ways to build trust between the United States and China by using new forms of technology, including gaming? There is a lot of gaming that um, promotes views of violence, grand theft auto, some of you know about that, and other games. Well, there are other games, including one developed uh, by one of our colleagues who was originally from Shanghai, who now works um, in LA, that are games that build up trust among the players. Rather than teaching people to be violent, it tries to reward people to be collaborative and cooperative. So the question that one could pose to this group is to what extent are we using as scholars these technologies to try to build up trust um, and cooperation among the, in the work that we do? Uh, do we wait too long just to go to an annual meeting or a biannual meeting? Or are there ways that we can use these new platforms to have these same kinds of discussions over the course of the year? Uh, let me just say a few words on, on some of the conceptual issues. Um, one is, is I love the idea of histories and trajectories uh, over the past decade or so. What has been the history of the internet in China? Is there a standard uh, narrative that we can even disagree with or agree with? Uh, part of this is a problem that many of those who have been making the in, uh, internet revolution in China, the information revolution in China, have been too busy making the revolution in China to spend time writing the histories. Um, and so I think that for those of us who are scholars, um, now is the time really to go back and look at the founders of some of these um, uh, companies and institutions uh, and look at the work that they did, whether it's the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, uh, the work that Jas Jasmine Jiang did to create the first uh, internet service provider. I think now is the time to go back and really take a strong historical perspective, analytic perspective, and, find, and, and to create competing narratives of what really happened uh, to bring the internet to China, including world in power. Uh, perhaps in doing that, I would um, uh, just urge that we think about the role that individuals have to shape institutions so that the internet revolution could come to China, and the impact that those institutions in turn had on the macro structure of the center. So it's a call for micro, meso, and macro <laughs> level understandings of the diffusion of the internet, not just as a tool, but as a causal factor that shaped the way individuals and organizations and large structures uh, have subsequently operated. Um, just two other quick issues on the substantive side. Um, well, one is a delight to see more and more work being done on the internet in rural areas. And, and that is a huge, this gets to uh, uh, Jack's point about places, that the internet use in, in, in a rural area is likely to be quite different from what it is in Shanghai, largely because the power structures and the resources that people bring to the internet are quite different in the, in the other setting. Um, and then going from the very micro to the very, very macro, um, what are going to be the global implications and impacts of the internet, of the Chinese internet on the global internet? In the United States, in the private sector, there's a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of concern that there will be a Russian uh, internet, a Chinese internet, an American internet, and a European internet. 
is that likely to happen? If so, what are the benefits and what are the uh, costs to various stakeholders in that process? Um, and then finally, and here I have to put plug in for the Annenberg one. <laughs> but, uh, it's a different Annenberg. It's the Annenberg uh, retreat at Sunnyland, where President Xi mm -hmm. and President uh, Obama met recently. Uh, one of the major issues there that came up is the issue of cyber security and cyber espionage, et cetera. And um, when I talk to people in Washington and when I talk to people in the private sector, the single most worrisome thing in the relationship between China and the United States of America is this issue of cyber security, cyber spying, et cetera, et cetera. And right now we have a dialogue with the deaf because the Americans say, oh, we're really not doing very much of that at all, but you Chinese are really stealing uh, up to $200 billion a year of our intellectual property. And the Chinese respond, the Chinese official delegation respond by saying, no, we're not. And if something is happening, it's not the government that's doing it. And by the way, you Americans are doing the same thing in the Middle East. So this may be an area uh, that touches on the internet that all of us are interested in that might be susceptible to academic and scholarly analysis to try to at least begin to develop a kind of um, empirical and conceptual baseline of what is actually going on. So again, I want to uh, congratulate the organizers of the conference. I want to uh, certainly thank our hosts here at Oxford for doing such a great job of welcoming us. And I certainly look forward to the next couple of days of great discussion with colleagues. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Uh, before I just wrap this up, uh, in response to Professor Wilson's request for a metric of what is a history, uh, I can give one point. I was on a summer school faculty, and I have to go look at the dates, late 90s, maybe the year 2000 at Rovereto, uh, put on by Pugwash, an arms control group of the United States that was dedicated to the rise of the internet. Uh, the person who was a great scholar on the use of the Internet in the Middle East pointed out, yes, there were people in Saudi Arabia who used the Internet, but it was mostly to keep in touch with their doctors in London. There were three Chinese men there, uh, I would say mid-career people, but fairly senior, who represented China and the Internet. They never spoke to anybody else.